Hello, I'm Elizabeth Betts and welcome back to my introduction to quilting. Today we're going to start with a little talk about assembling a quilt and different ways of quilting. We will then be using these techniques to make a table mat with quilted seat heads and learning an easy binding technique. So to start, let's talk about what the process of layering a quilt is, also known as assembling a quilt or basting. There are four stages of making a quilt. You've got your quilt top and this is usually patchworked fabric but it can also be just one piece of fabric that is then quilted. Stage two, this is assembling the quilt or basting and this is where you get your backing fabric, wadding and your quilt top and lay out the three layers and hold them together ready for quilting. And here's an example here and this is what we're going to be talking about later on today. Stage three is quilting which you can see here with the stitches, hand quilting stitches on it here. And then stage four is binding. And that's the term given to the strips of fabric that encase the edges of the quilt to make it all look lovely and neat. Before I show how I base my quilts, just to mention about wadding or batting as it is called in America. This is available in lots of different types, cotton, polyester, bamboo, wool, soya, even a fibre from recycled plastic bottles. It seems every time I go to a quilt show, there is another type. If you're working on something you want to be very thin, you can even just use a layer of muslin in the middle of the layers. I usually use 100% cotton wadding or a blend of 80% cotton and 20% polyester. However, look for shops that sell small packs of the different types and give them a go. For example, these here, and you can see they're all different colors. And when you touch them, you can feel they've got different fibers. You can also buy black or white wadding, which is here at the back, that are good if you make a quilt that uses a lot of these colours. Usual wadding is cream, such as this. So by using one of the white ones behind white fabric, it makes it look crisper. And using black behind a dark quilt keeps it looking that way and you can't see it behind it. Also, when you buy wadding, pay attention to the packaging. This will tell you how much quilting your work needs. For example, this leaflet that came with the wadding tells me I need a stitch every 10 inches and it also tells me how much the wadding will shrink by when it's first washed. So on to layering the quilt. Now I will make a confession here, this is my least favourite stage of making a quilt. Stage 1 the patchwork and stage 3 the quilting have a creative element to them. You can play with colour and pattern so there's something aesthetically pleasing. The technique of layering a quilt is functional and so really not as exciting. It's important to get this stage correct though so that your finished quilt is lovely and flat with no naughty folds or tucks on the back. I'm demonstrating here on a smallish quilt, however do bear in mind that the larger the quilt the more involved this stage gets. Now before starting, get prepared. Press your backing fabric. Now you can use one piece of fabric for the back and for larger quilts look for wider widths of fabric or you can join pieces of fabric together. You can join pieces of the same fabrics or different fabrics which can look really interesting which is what I've done with this quilt here. If you've bought pre-packed wadding, it can be a good idea to get it out of the pack a day before you're going to use it to allow any creases to fall out. Next stage is to press your quilt top well and trim any stray threads. There's nothing more annoying than finishing quilting and seeing a loose thread through the fabric trapped in the layers and it's too late to get it, get it out. So step one, so get your backing fabric and lay out on a smooth table or a floor wrong side up. If I'm working on a quilt bigger than about 75 centimetres, I place masking tape round the edge of the fabric to hold it flat like this, making sure I don't pull the fabric too taut. Step two is to gently place your wadding on top of the backing fabric. Smooth the wadding from the middle out towards the edges. I like to use my hands because I can feel there's no creases on the back and it's all lovely and flat. Step three is to get your quilt top and place it in the middle of the wadding and the backing right side up. And again I'm smoothing it, working from the centre out to make sure the layers are all lovely and flat. Once you're happy that all the layers are flat, I then hold the layers together 
either using safety pins or by tacking. Quilters pins are curved safety pins and they look like this. To pin baste, start in the middle of the quilt and pin through the layers about every four inches, working methodically in a grid format. When it's finished, it should look like this. And you can see the pins are in a grid format, about four inches apart. You can also tack the quilt together and to do this use thread and a darning needle, which is a long needle, and stitch lines of long running stitches, working in the same way as before in a grid format from the centre out towards the edge of the quilt. And here's a finished one. And you can see we've got lines of stitching in the grid format. There are pros and cons to both techniques. I find pins quicker to use and I store them in a jar like this so I can just tip them out and use them. You'll see that I've got them open which means that you can just take them out and get tacking straight away with them. They're good for machine quilting as you can take them out if they get in the way of your sewing. Um, you can end up machine quilting over tacking stitches which then makes it more difficult to pull them out. If you're hand quilting a large quilt and a hoop then it can be time consuming taking pins out if they get in the way of your frame so hand tacking can be better. It's also cheaper. I often use cheap threads for tacking, the kind of threads that wouldn't be used for anything else. Think of the things you get free with a purchase. Do be careful to use a neutral colour though because remember if we're using a cheaper thread for tacking we don't want to end up with dots of say black or red dye all the way through the quilt. So I've got a couple of tips for you. We've got the backing fabric and the wadding bigger than the quilt. I work to a generous four inches bigger on each side. There are several reasons for this. When you quilt, it can pull in the backing fabric and the wadding as you're putting the stitches in. So if they start off at the same size as the quilt top, then they can end up smaller than it and you would end up having to cut it down and you don't want to lose any of your quilt top. It also makes it easier for layering the quilt if the wadding and the backing are too small, then you can think you've layered it okay, and then when you finish doing all that pinning or tacking, you can pick it up, turn it over, and you'll see the front isn't lined up with the back, so you have to undo all your work and reposition it again. Another reason is it gives you extra fabric to move and hold onto when quilting. A final tip comes from my experience of chatting to quilters. Whether you pin or tack, there is a sharp point regularly going through all the layers. Make sure you're not doing this on a friend's best newly varnished table or floor as it can leave little scratch marks behind on the surface. Not good for furniture or friendships if you're borrowing someone else's large table. So remember, it may not be the most exciting stage of quilt making, but layering the quilt correctly is essential to get a good finished quilt. Hi, I'm now going to talk a little about quilting. The process of quilting is basically holding the layers together. This can be done by hand stitching, as we're going to be doing today, and machine stitching, more of which we will cover in sessions five and six. It can also be done with ties and buttons. Just think of holding the layers together. Here's a sample I've made with buttons. And then I've got a sample here with ties. And these little ties just go all the way through the layers, so they act as quilting. If we didn't quilt, the wadding would end up balling up inside when you wash your quilt. It makes your work stronger and it adds texture. Quilting can be purely functional, just holding the layers together, or decorative, adding pattern to the quilt. In terms of quilting design, it can stump some people. You've got so far on choosing your fabric and the type of piecing you're doing that it can be perplexing to now have to think about another design possibility. A few tips is to look out for a pattern within the fabric. For example, on this quilt here, I could have taken this motif and then quilted this in the squares. Alternatively, you can look at the shape of the piecing on the quilt, as I've done, and I've just echoed the squares. You can also just simply stitch straight lines across the quilt, as I've done here. And on this quilt, I followed the lines, but I've used different colours thread to match the colours in the quilt, so you can have a little bit of fun with it. You can also do a pattern that just ignores what's on the quilt. So for example, on this large hexagon quilt, I've quilted circles of different shapes and sizes in a random way all over it. 
Once you've decided what pattern to quilt, you need to mark on the quilting pattern. Here are some tools I like to use. Chalk is really easy and I like these Chaco liners. They look a bit like a lipstick and the end has a chalk roller like this. You simply put them on the fabric and roll it and the chalk just rubs off. Do check it before using it on a quilt though, that it does all rub off. Then we have sew line pencils which have ceramic leads and they give you a really fine line and you can buy them with leads in all different colours depending on the colour of the quilt you're working on. Pressure markers such as this Hero marker are good. They create a line without using chemicals. You simply use pressure and then you've got your line to follow when you quilt. This is quarter inch masking tape and again this is good if you're doing straight lines. You simply put it on your work, stitch a line next to it and then when you've finished you can reuse it several times till it loses its stick. We've got pens and water soluble pens are handy. You can get them in this kind of thickness like a felt tip or you can get them in a thinner thickness. You simply draw on your work, follow the line and then you use some water, this here's on a kitchen towel, and just dab it with water until the line disappears. You can also get vanishing pens which you mark on and then in about 48 hours the line vanishes. Do be careful though if you're marking a large quilt as you can get to the end and the, the starting point has already disappeared. Now a hot tip for you, always test the method you are using for marking quilting designs. There's nothing worse than marking up a quilt with a pen that then for some reason, such as reacting with the dyes in the fabric, doesn't come off. Keep your packaging. With so many products available, you can buy something, use it once, then put it back in your sewing box. By keeping the packaging with it, you will remember how to use it. A further tip of mine is not to iron the top of marking pens, particularly the water-soluble pens. I learnt this the hard way 10 years ago and still shudder at the thought of the water-soluble pen that I ironed. The heat fixes it in place so it doesn't vanish when you put water on it and it ended up looking like a child had drawn lines on my work in blue felt tip pen. Not a good look. I'm going to show you big stitch quilting. This is hand quilting that uses a thick thread and larger stitches than traditional quilting. For this I use Perlay size 8 thread and a needle that suits it. I use chenille needles in a size 22. These have a big eye for threading and a sharp point for sewing through the layers. I sometimes get asked about using stranded embroidery floss as many stitches inherit or are given boxes of it but it isn't suitable as the thread tends to break when sewn repeatedly through the three layers. I have my sample here and I threaded my needle with approximately 18 inches of the Perlay 8 thread. The end has a knot in it and I've put my quilt in a frame. Quilting frames come as large hoops like the embroidery ones or these square tubular frames. I like these square frames as they come apart and are so easy to store. For example this is one what one looks like in a pack. Make sure your quilt has lots of bounce in the frame. We don't pull it tight like we would if we were doing embroidery and with these tubular frames you can just twist the edges to give it more bounce. When quilting, start in the centre and work methodically out towards the edge. Always think that you are smoothing the layers. If you start at the edge and work towards the centre, you could end up with excess fabric in the middle and we don't want that. So the first thing to do when quilting is to secure the end of the thread and we do this by popping the knot. You get your needle and you place it through the top layer and wadding, not the backing about an inch from where you want to start. Pull the thread until the knot's on the surface and then give it an extra pull and you'll hear a pop. Like that. And then we're just going to make sure it's nicely anchored there and then we're ready to start quilting. So I've popped my knot and it's nice and secure at my starting point. And then I'm going to put my needle through at a 90 degree angle. You'll notice I'm using a thimble that's got grips on it so it's going to hold the end of the needle. And my finger underneath is just where the needle's coming out. As I said before, if you're not comfortable with that, look at these leather thimbles 
they're really good for protecting your finger underneath and then I've got my thimble on top my finger underneath and I'm just putting my finger my th thumb in front of it here and I'm rocking so I'm going down I can feel it on the back then back up to the front and I'm just going to pull that through I'm just going to do that again so I'm going down through to the back my thumb in front making this little hill here back and back up to the front just take that back a tiny bit using my thimble to press it through then when you get to the end of your row make a knot and I do it by looping the thread and then putting the needle in the thread and pulling it down so the knot is one stitch length away from where we want to end and then we take our last stitch and this time we're doing the same as we did at the start and we're just going through the top fabric and the wadding and we're traveling about an inch and we're just going to pop that through there we go and then what I'm going to do now is just trim that bit of thread at the end and that's it sewn there now there's a nice shortcut you can do if you're stitching near the edge I do sometimes put a knot in the end and I will just bury it in the layers here to stop and start and I mentioned at the beginning you can just sew a running stitch here's a quilt that's just been basted with pins and if it's well basted you could just sew through as you would a normal running stitch using the technique of popping the knots at the start and finish it depends what one you prefer so try a bit of both and go with what you enjoy doing this project uses one piece of fabric on the front so it can be referred to as a whole cloth we'll be trying out quilting as well as learning the technique of self binding I've included instructions to make one mat. I like to have a table mat in the centre of my table to provide a focus. However, if you want to make a set, just adjust the amount of fabric you buy. So on with the project. I have plain fabric for the front, a ball of perlay thread size 8 for quilting, and I have patterned fabric for the back. When choosing this fabric, take into consideration that it would be brought round to the front of the edges so it will frame your quilting, so choose the colour that works. You also need some 100% cotton sewing thread that tones with the backing fabric for stitching, the binding on at the end, and a piece of wadding. From your sewing box you'll need pins, a sharp sewing needle, you need a chenille needle, number 22 I recommend, you need fabric scissors, a handful of quilter safety pins, a water soluble pen, and I've got some kitchen towel to take the marks off at the end and some quarter inch wide tack masking tape. You don't definitely need the tape, but it is handy for doing the last bit of stitching. You also need a ruler and a pencil for trimming your table mat to size at the end. Finally, we'll also be using an iron and ironing board later on. So on with the project. First thing to do is to prepare your template. You have to enlarge it by 141% and any good photocopy shop will be able to do it for you. And you then just need to stick the two parts together. Once you've got this, you need to trace the motifs onto your plain fabric for the front using a water soluble pen. If you find it tricky to see the lines through the fabric, use a light box. Alternatively, you can copy the pattern onto the paper like this, put it up at the window and then put masking tape on it to hold it there and then masking tape your fabric to the front and then you can trace your motifs. Quick warning, do remember to test your water soluble pen on a scrap piece of fabric and ideally don't use a black fabric because obviously it won't show up on it. So the next stage is to layer your quilt. And I've got my backing fabric and my wadding here, all lovely and smoothed. And then I'm just placing my top in the center with the right side up. I'm giving it a smooth, and then I'm just going to put some pins through it in a grid format, just to hold it together, ready for us to quilt it. So onto the quilting. Following the lines, just quilt your seed heads 
and you've got full instructions in your handouts. When you've finished, it should look like this, and you can use a piece of kitchen towel with cold water and just dab it on it, and that should get rid of the pen. The next stage is to trim your wadding level with your quilt top. So to do this, I'm gonna place a ruler between the layers because we want to make sure we're only cutting the wadding and we're not cutting through to the backing fabric. Alternatively, you can fold it over and then cut. And then it should look like that. The next stage is to cut your backing so it's one and a quarter inches wider than the centre fabric all the way round. I'm going to do this by marking the line with a pencil and a ruler. However, if you're already happy using a rotary cutter, you can also use that. So I'm just lining up one and a quarter inches. Drawing a line, then I'm going to use scissors and I'm just going to cut down that line. And I'm going to repeat this stage all the way round. And this is what it looks like when it's all been cut down to size. We've cut this an inch and a quarter bigger, but with larger quilts I tend to cut them an inch and a half. But you can decide what kind of size binding you want to do with this. Quick note about the quilting, I've just used a running stitch because it was too small for me to put in a frame and one of the beauties of using a back that's quite busy is you very rarely can see your quilting stitches that well and if you're a bit nervous about quilting then this actually can be a slight blessing because you can concentrate on what they look like on the front and not worry too much if your stitches might be slightly uneven or small on the back so you can just have a go with a running stitch and relax and enjoy it. Now the final part of the binding is to take it to the ironing board and on the two sides we're going to take the raw edge to the side of the quilt and we're going to press that fold and then we're going to fold it over again and lightly press. I say lightly because we've got the wadding but this is a cotton wadding. I wouldn't press if I was using polyester because it would fizzle up. So we're going to press that and then we're going to stitch down and we're just going to do that on the two opposite sides to start with. So once you've slip stitched the sides, you then do the same with the top and bottom and it just creates this corner here. So you end up with these nice neat corners. Then the final stage is to quilt a board around. I'm using this quarter inch tape and I stick this just in from the binding and then stitch just alongside it. You could also mark this with your water soluble pen if you like, but I quite like this tape and it's repositionable so I can then move it as I stitch around the edge. And to do that I'll use my perlay thread and I could use a different colour to what I've done my seed heads in just to have a bit more fun with it. And then your table mat is finished.